So, um, okay, I'll start. So, in fact, this right here is my favorite Cartan matrix. At Q equals one, you may recognize it. And one of the goals of this talk will be to explain why this weird thing is significant. Okay, so um, here's a fast introduction. Geometric satake. It's a very powerful, very beautiful theorem. It connects. So, yeah. Yeah. Geometric satake is fun. It's great. It's awesome. Um, it connects the geometry uh, associated to the affine wall group um, to the representation theory of an algebraic Lie group. Unfortunately, it's very hard to state. The proof is very technical. Um, uh, unfortunately, it's hard. So the proof in the literature uses Tanakhian formalism. It sort of says, it, it constructs an equivalence of categories, but very abstractly. It doesn't really say what goes to what. It just says, well, we know that these are equivalent. And it also relies in a deep way on the, on the decomposition theorem, which is the hardest theorem in all of mathematics ever. Um, and so uh, it's full of tears. Um, now, my goal and so what I'm going to do in this talk is give it a, a state and prove an equivalent, almost prove, an equivalence of two categories, um, which is easier in every way. Um, so I, I'm going to call this algebraic satake, uh, or zergel satake. There are actually two, um, two very similar, slightly different statements. Um, this is going to be an equivalence of two categories, which has no tiers. It's quite easy. The proof is just straightforward and algebraic. Okay. Unfortunately, it only works in type A, and for actually important reasons. Um, however, a beautiful feature of this algebraic version is that it quantizes. It has a Q deformation, which actually relates the representation theory of a quantum group to something mysterious, which has no associated geometry. Okay, so by making this algebraic, you then allow it to be quantized, and geometry hasn't caught up yet. Um, so this is actually a very interesting and, and amazing thing. Unfortunately, explaining the connection between that and geometric satake is difficult. So I'm going to skip that and, and, and just describe the easy thing. And then later at the end, once you have a little intuition, I'll explain how they're connected to geometric satake. So the rest of the intro is coming later. Uh, it's a good thing that I recognize everyone here, because this is billed as a colloquium talk, but I was told to take no prisoners. So there will be no tears, but also no prisoners. OK. So. It is the representation theory of SL2. This is something that I've already talked about a little bit in the, in the lecture series. But let me do it now here to some people who are new. So representations of SL2 is a sunny, simple, monoidal category. Operate C. So it has irreps, irreducibles, Vn parameterized by integers, and it has a tensor product which satisfies V1. So V0 is the monoidal identity, so that V1 tensor V0 is, is V1, but V1 tensor Vn, Vn plus 1 plus Vn minus 1. So this tells you everything about the Grossendieck group of this category as a ring. Unfortunately, the Grossendieck group of a category does not determine the category. Okay? So semi-simple categories are easy. Which is to say that, for instance, you know what HOM VW is for two different objects. You decompose them into simples, and then you know there's only maps between the simples that are the same. And therefore we even know how to compose maps. Okay? This is this is easy to describe. 
Okay? But not easy as monoidal categories. So there's not just a normal composition structure on these things, but you can tensor them together and then compose those. So for instance, um, so th this is not easy. So here's, here's a very distinct sort of question. Describe the direct sum, I'll say over what in a sec, of hom vn1 tensor vn2 vnd So this is a, a Hom space between uh, some tensor products of irreducibles, so the direct sum over all sequences. Now, these Hom spaces have two products. You can compose them from n to m and then from m to you know, p, or you can take monoidal tensor products and put them side to side. Okay? So this has, with its two compositions, Horizontal, which is the monoidal one, and vertical, which is the composition one. So find some sort of combinatorial description of this. I can tell you a combinatorial description of this just by counting irreducibles. It's really determined by the growth index group. But I can't tell you a combinatorial description of this, certainly just based on the growth index group. You actually need to do something. Okay? And this question can be asked for any G, not just SL2. And it's a wide open question. This is totally difficult, okay? It's only known for SL2, <laughs> okay? Um, so there's an answer, but, it, but it's not an easy one, <laughs> okay? Um, so you want to describe it as... Just find some combinatorial description. But you need to have a combinatorial description, not of just how big this is, which is easy, but of how the maps actually compose. And that's harder. Okay. So the general philosophy toward addressing a question like this is that when we're trying to study a monoidal category, it can be hard. So instead, find a nice subcategory, which is easy. Find nice additive subcategories. So this is something, in, in the lecture we just saw, IC sheaves are hard. Push forwards of constant sheaves from resolutions are easy. Okay? This is exactly the same statement. Okay? So we find a nice additive category. So here it is. So fund SL2 will have objects just n-fold tensor products of the standard representation. So objects are in bijection with the natural numbers. And the Hom spaces will be SL2 maps. So this is not a this is not a abelian category, right? It doesn't you can't it doesn't include its own sum ends. But it certainly contains, so uh, by by the recursive formula over there. Vn is actually a sum and of V1 tensor n. Which means that if you take the Kerubi envelope of this category, which is the formal addition of all sum ands, you get back all representations. So if you understand everything about this category, then you understand everything about that one. In some sense. At least abstractly. Okay. So this leads to question two, the more reasonable question, which I'll write here because I like this is a good spot. And it's just, you know, the same question. Describe the direct sum over n and m, now just integers, of um, v1 tensor n to v1 tensor n with its two compositions. Okay. Now this has a famous and elegant answer. Known as the Temple Lieb category. 
Okay? And when I write down the template lead category, I'm actually already going to include the queued information, because why not? So this is going to be the monoidal category, where the objects are in bijection with n. And of course, the monoidal structure is addition. So um, just like you'd expect from v1 tensor n. And hum from n to m are going to be z q q inverse linear combinations of things called nm crossingless matchings. Okay, so what is an nm crossingless matching? So you put n dots on bottom and m dots on top. And this space is empty unless they have the same parity, actually. And then you just match them up somehow by lines in such a way that the lines never cross. That's a crossingless matching with n on the bottom and m on top. So for reasons unknown, I like to read things from bottom to top. Okay, so this is some set of diagrams. I have to tell you what the two composition structures are. So these have to be combinatorial. So horizontal uh, composition is just concatenation. Okay, so if next to this I had a map from 3 to 3 that looked like this, then by erasing this line, I get the horizontal composition. And the vertical composition is also concatenation, but then you have to resolve um, certain, certain things. So if I take this diagram and I stacked it on top of this diagram, okay? then what I get is, well, it really is a, a crossingless matching between what remains on the overall boundary. All right, this is still matched up to this. This is matched up to that, with these two being matched. This ends up coming down here. This gets here. Except that I have this circle. Okay? And so the, re the resolution rule is that a circle is replaced by a factor of minus q plus q inverse. So over here I'd get minus q plus q inverse. This is a linear combination of diagrams. Okay, so there it is. It's a convention. Um, this is the convention that makes Jones Wenzel projectors nicer to describe. It makes the, it's the convention where all Jones Wenzel projectors have positive coefficients. So you have to deal with signs when computing traces, but not when computing maps. But anyway, that will be irrelevant for this talk. So there's an old theorem, I think maybe due to Kaufman, maybe, which is that um, there exists a functor from the temporal leap category at q equals 1 to fond SL2. Obviously, it sends n to v1 tensor n. And Every diagram is a horizontal and vertical concatenation, man, these chalks squeak, of diagrams like this, cups and caps. And these are going to be sent to inclusion and projection of, well, v1 tensor 2, like this guy here or this guy there, to v1 tensor 0, which is also known as the second exterior power of v1, since this is SL2. So these inclusion and projection maps are defined up to scalar, and you choose the scalars such that things hold. Okay? So this is an old theorem, and, and that this is, in fact, an equivalence. And if you actually keep the same Q, this is representations of UQ SL2, fundamental representation, tensor products of funnels, fundamentals of UQ SL2. Um, I guess the remark is that, you know, how do you get from question two back to question one? Okay? So if you want to get from question two back to question one, what you have to do is you have to find 
um, the description of some idempotent inside V1 tensor N, uh, which projects to the sum and Vn. And if you find this idempotent, then you can sort of understand general maps by sort of taking V1 to the sum and putting these idempotents in the right places. So these idempotents are called Jones Wenzel projectors in this case. For other SGs, they're called clasps. And clasps aren't really known outside of type, uh, outside of rank two. Um, so this is a very hard question. Um, now let me just make one key remark. This, that was an aside. This is important. And it's one of my pet peeves that sort of people often forget to separate between an algebra and its regular representation. So you can think of representations of SL2 as a monoidal category, or you can think of the action of SL2 on itself by tensor product. And these are actually two separate things in a way which I'll explain. OK, so key observation. All right, so rep SL2 acts on rep SL2. This is like the regular representation. But representations of SL2 split into even representations and odd representations. OK, things with even highest weights and odd highest weights. And never the two shall mix. So that you know, when you have something acting on a two-dimensional vector space, you express it with two by two matrices. Any functor acting on this thing should decompose into a two by two block of functors. Okay, so um, so the point is that you know, even though v one is irreducible on the right hand side, tensoring with v one as a functor is reducible. Sorry, is in decomposable, decomposable. Okay, and it decomposes into two different parts. Okay, it's actually v1 tensor restricted to the even part, um, which what it does is it takes an arbitrary representation w to zero, zero if w is odd, and w tensor v if w is even. And then plus, you know, the odd part. Okay, and of course, tensoring with v1 switches even to odd and vice versa. Okay, so the functor actually decomposes. Right. So the, the correct way to actually encode this structure is in a two-category. Okay. So here, here, here's my two-category, two TL. Okay, which is isomorphic to what I'll call fund SL2 Z mod 2Z. Two categorical version. So the objects are just even and odd. These are the two objects. And I'm going to color them red and blue, kind of to indicate that they're the same. I don't care which one's even and which one's odd. <laughs> okay? Like the, what's special about the trivial representation is that it's a monoidal identity. It's important here, not there. Um, the one morphism, instead of being generated by tensoring with V, are now generated by even goes to odd, and odd goes to even, tensoring with V. And the two morphisms are colored, um, colored uh, crossingless matchings, uh, linear combinations. So if you, if you go back to these earlier diagrams and you shade every region with an alternating color, I'll just do this for this first diagram here. Okay. Then if you're reading along the top, you have a morphism, a one morphism, even odd, even odd, even. And then this two morphism is a, is a two morphism, okay? So, you know, there's two different versions of tensoring with V, blue to red and red to blue. There they are. This is a very silly and obviously tautological statement, okay? But 
it, it's sort of more natural to have it colored than uncolored. The, the two morphisms are linear combinations of colored diagrams. One of the real reasons that this is going to be important to me is that I'm going to say that this two category is equivalent to another one that isn't just an obvious tautological construction. That's sort of genuinely um, different. That these two colors are different. Okay. Um, so, you know, this is more natural than this. So now, I've described one side of the equivalence, the two-colored temporal Lieb algebra. I'm now going to describe the other side of the equivalence. And this other side is going to be singular Zergel bimodules for affine SL2. So what am I going to do? I'll start with H dual, which is the reflection representation of the affine wall group of SL2. Uh, let's make this um, let's make this very explicit, okay? For those of you who may not be up on this, this is generated by two guys, each of which is an involution, so S squared and T squared are one, and there's no other relations. It's an infinite dihedral group, and this representation is governed by a Cartan matrix. 2, minus 2, minus 2, 2. What do I mean by this? I mean that H is a span of just two vectors, and that the action is given by S of alpha t is alpha t minus A S t alpha S. A S t being the entry in this matrix. So. Uh, actually, you know, this the same formula works in general, alpha s minus a s t alpha s. So, you know, in this case, a s t is minus 2, so this is alpha t plus 2 alpha s, whereas this is minus alpha s. So this is the reflection representation. The formulas for t are exactly the same. So very, very explicit. We're going to let r be polynomial functions in these guys. Okay? So this is just a, a straightforward polynomial ring on two generators. Nothing fancy. Okay? But the point is that it has an action of this, of this group. Okay? Um, and we're also going to assume that this ring is graded for sort of, you know, this ring is really an equivariant cohomology ring. Uh, so these generators are actually in degree 2, not in degree 1. a standard fact. Um, and if you look inside this at, say, the invariance under S, okay, polynomials such that SF is F, it also has a nice description. It's also a polynomial ring by Chevrolet's theorem. And it's generated by alpha S squared and alpha S plus alpha T. And these are algebraically independent. Wonderful. But this isn't just an arbitrary, nice ring extension. This is something called a Frobenius extension. So I've, I've been talking about this quite a bit in my other class. This is a Frobenius extension. OK, so normally, induction and restriction are adjoint to each other in one direction. And then restriction is adjoint to co-induction. But for Frobenius extension, it's adjoint on both sides. Well, there's a much simpler description of this structure. Okay, part of this structure is this map called the Demazur operator, which is a symmetrizing operator, actually an anti-symmetrizing operator. It takes a polynomial to f minus sf divided by alpha s, and the numerator divides the denominator. So this is a genuine polynomial. OK. So now we've got this. Um, so this is a nice ring extension, and we can use it. We can use the induction and restriction functors to do nice things, as opposed to the remark. You know, obviously, if we do the same thing with RT, we also get a Frobenius extension. 
But uh, we can't do the same thing with total invariance. So the invariants under the whole ring, w, are actually just generated by the linear term alpha s plus alpha t. And this is a point that we will bring in the wrong number of generators. Okay? So this extension is infinite rank. And, and so you can't possibly have a Frobenius extension. Okay? So this is not nice. And the reason that this happens is because w is infinite. Whereas this is invariance under z mod 2z, which is finite. And this will show up in an important way soon. OK, so what are we going to do? Consider the bimodule R viewed, well, OK, R with a grading shift, which says that the identity is in degree minus 1. And it's going to be viewed as an RS module on the right and an RT module on the left. So tensoring with this is actually just taking an RS module, inducing it to R, and restricting it to RT. Okay? This is induction composed with restriction with a shift, which is kind of what shows up from the Frobenius thing. So this thing is, is actually by a joint to doing it the other way. So tensoring with these guys give various things, induced or strict. And what we're interested in is the category that they generate. So this terrible thing, maximally singular bot Samuelson bimodules, uh, which I'm going to abbreviate to C, <laughs> um, is the two category with objects uh, so ob is, you know, rs and rt, which again I'm going to color red and blue. Okay, the one morphisms are generated by these bimodules and the other guy, and the two morphisms are just bimodule maps. Right, so I mean, one morphisms are tensor products of these things. So things of the form R tensor over RS, R tensor over RT, R tensor over RS, R. The shift by 4. Something like that. Would be an object. Okay? So the point is, what we're really interested in are some ends of these things. Okay? These guys are actually the equivariant cohomologies of certain uh, bot samuelson resolutions of orbits in the affine Grassmannian. Okay? Um, so th because these are equivariant cohomologies, they're the endomorphism rings of the constant sheaves on these spaces, as well as the endomorphism rings of the push forwards of the constant sheaves. So we're really interested in some ends of these push forwards, which means that we're interested in some ends of these bot modules. Okay? But this is the nice additive replacement. Okay? This is like taking fundamental representations. Okay? This is already, um, already on the nice side. Okay? And the theorem is that there's this, this two functor from, well, the two color temporal relief algebra to C. Okay? It's going to send. You know, it's going to do the obvious thing. It's going to send blue, red, blue, red. Each dot is going to go to R. To R, 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 tensor over red, tensor over blue, with blue on the right and red on the left. OK? And it's going to send, now I just need to tell you what happens to these colored cups and caps. Okay, so this has to go, well, I'll do it where I have a little more room. This has to go to some bimodule map from what to what. This is a map from 
R tensor R over Rs to the monoidal identity of RT, of RT by modules, so RT. It has to be RT by linear. And it just sends F tensor G to, well, multiply them together and then take DT. And you'll get something which is invariant under T. OK? Meanwhile, this other one, is sent to some map in the other direction. Okay, and this map in the other direction, well, it's RT bilinear, so we just need to know where we send 1. And 1 will actually go to um, 1 half alpha s tensor 1 plus 1 tensor alpha s. This is a natural coproduct element in this Frobenius extension. Okay, but the point is that you can check the composition of these two things, the circle, It's a map from 0 to 0. And this is exactly the same thing as dt of alpha s, which was this off-diagonal entry in the Cartan matrix, which is a t s, which is minus 2. So this agrees with q equals 1, sorry. OK? So in fact, you can check that this does give you a functor. A two functor. Yeah, when, when Q is one, yeah. Okay. So there's a reason for my <laughs> choice of convention, all right? Um, uh, so um, I suppose, now this thing is not exactly an equivalence, okay? I'm going to write equivalence is sub zero. The reason is that this is a graded category, okay? And there's graded morphisms. You know? So for instance, the endomorphisms of R as an R, R, R S, R, T by module is actually just R, multiplication by polynomials. It's a commutative ring. Okay? But in degree 0, the endomorphism ring is just scalars. Okay? Um, in degree 0, scalars. So these uh, shifts were exactly designed so that this is a map of degree 0. Okay? Um, and this equivalent 0 means that uh, Homs between you know, the some things in the image is purely in non-negative degree. And that the degree 0 part is hit fully faithfully. OK, so we get all the degree 0 maps. And degree 0 maps tell you about idempotence. They tell you about how things decompose. They tell you everything about the Kirby envelope, for instance. OK? Um, so uh, basically, um, what I've just proven is what I like to call algebraic satake. Which is the statement that fundamental representations of SL2, this two categorical version, is equivalent uh, in degree zero to maximally singular bot Samuelson bimodules. And that implies that the Kirby envelopes, which in this case was just this um, Z mod 2Z version of ref, is equivalent the Kirby envelope of this, which is maximally singular Zergel bimodules. Okay, this is defined to be the Kirby envelope. And these are the things that are supposed to be the equivariant cohomologies of perverse sheaves, so the equivariant uh, global sections, hypercohomologies. Okay, so this is the algebraic Satake equivalence, but if you ignore any little statements I made about geometry, this is incredibly straightforward. Okay, I mean, this, this, is, this is the kind of thing you can go home and compute yourself without any knowledge of anything. Yeah, I'll explain that in a sec when I explain how this generalizes. I suppose before I do, I'll explain the Q deformation. 
okay? Which is start with the Cartan matrix, 2 minus q plus q inverse, minus q plus q inverse, 2. Some weird Cartan matrix defined over zqq inverse. And then define an action of the affine group on the span of two things by this matrix instead. If you want, q is a complex number. Okay? And now repeat the entire construction. Everything will work. And you'll note that because this value right here was just ds of alpha, dt of alpha s, what you'll end up with is that the two temporal leave algebra without the quotient, a generic q, will map to a maximally singular plot cells and plot modules. Okay, now there's no geometric explanation for this q deformation. So who knows where this came from? It's totally mysterious to me. I'd love for an explanation. Somebody help, please. But no one that I've spoken to has ever seen this Cartan matrix before. So, you know, the special values you've certainly seen. Q is one you've seen. Q is a sixth root of unity you've seen. That's type A. Type normal A, A2. Eighth root of unity you've seen. That's type B2. Anyway, um, so let's do a general statement. Okay, so let's fix a Lie algebra G. Ah. Um, and we have fun G inside rep G. This is tensor products of fundamental representations associated to fundamental weights. Um, now, rep G is omega graded, where omega is. This the fundamental. It's called the fundamental group of G. It's the weight lattice module or the root lattice, and it's some finite abelian group. Okay. And so we can construct two categorical versions of these by coloring regions by um, by elements of omega. Okay. So really, you have two categories: fund omega G inside rep omega g. And this is going to be one side of our equivalence. On the other side, we're going to do basically the same thing as before. So we're going to let h dual be the reflection representation of the affine wall group of, of G. So the simple reflections in this affine wall group are in, a, are, are in bijection with the affine Dinkin diagram. So in type A, this affine Dinkin diagram is a, is a circle. OK? Now, for any subset, actually any, any proper subset, of the Dinkin diagram, you can consider the corresponding parabolic subgroup of the affine thing, and this will be finite. Okay. So that you can take, let R be polynomials, let Ri be the invariance under this finite parabolic subgroup, and Chevalier's theorem says that this will be a, well, finite extent, but actually a Frobenius extent. So that you can do many of the same things. Okay? But we don't actually want to go all the way from our i up to r and back down. We want to do a much simpler thing, which is this. Oh, okay, so I'll, I'll just I'll say it. So singular zirkle bimodules. Okay. Actually, we're gonna do all sorts of things. So the objects, so sorry, are going to be proper subsets of, of this guy. The one morphisms will be Ri, Rj bimodules um, generated by induction and restriction uh, from between sort of you know two different things Rk um, and Rl 
where these are just so you induce from here to here, and then restrict from there to there, and induce, restrict, do any sort of crazy induction restriction, so long as you stay within proper subsets. Okay? Yes, exactly. Composition is tensor product, or, or just composition of functors, either way. And yeah, two morphisms are just bimodule maps. And then we also take, so and we have all the things generated by this and some ands. Okay, and, and direct sums and grading shifts and stupid things like that. Okay, so this is what it means to be a singular Zergel bimodule. Okay? Now, this is a very big class of things. Okay? Um, first off, we want to restrict to maximally singular Zergel bimodules which is where the objects are only those proper things iso where, where i is itself isomorphic to the finite Dinkin diagram. In other words, the parabolic is associated to the finite wall group. So in type A, it's all ways to remove a vertex. OK? So it's different copies of the finite wall group inside the affine wall group. However, what you induce and restrict to along the way can be arbitrary. Okay. So the Zergel Satake, Satake theorem equivalence is the statement that representations of G created by omega should give a degree zero equivalence to maximally singular Zergel bimodules. This is true for all types. And it's not something I intend to be able to prove, and it's equivalent to geometric satake. So, um, you know, it's, it's true. <laughs> okay? Um, I'm, not, I'm not claiming that there's an easy proof of it. But, you know, again, these are two monoidal categories, or rather two categories. And when you're trying to study them, you know, one hopes to find nice combinatorial subcategories where you can actually do something with them. Okay? So, you know, if you actually want to prove this, you should actually find some subcategories and take their Kirby envelopes. Just like before. So, in type A, we have nice subcategories. So, the point is, we, we already know what the nice subcategory of one side is. It's going to be tensor products of fundamentals. But, but the point is that in type A, all fundamentals are minuscule, and so we can understand things fairly easily. Um, so this has a nice description, has a combinatorial description by things called SLN webs. So this is due to Kautis, Kamenitzer, and Morrison in 2013. Fairly recent. Okay. And I'll just say it's generated by maps that look like this. Okay, so uh, where i plus j plus k equals n. So this is the map from lambda i from the ith fundamental representation, so the ith exterior power of the standard rep, tends to the jth exterior power. I'm oh, sorry, these all have orientations to the dual of the case. Okay. Meanwhile, um, meanwhile. Uh, maximally singular bot Samuelson, sorry, singular bot Samuelsons, which is this exact definition except without taking some ends. Okay, just induction restriction. Has a combinatorial description. And again, that only works in type A. So no one knows how to do this outside of type A. No one knows how to do this outside of type A. Uh, via singular Zergel diagrams. And this is due to myself and Jordy Williamson in, let's say, 2015. Um, and, you know, what, what this is generated by are various cups and caps corresponding to sort of canonical things that come from a Frobenius structure, as well as certain crossings, which correspond to the fact that if we sort of start here, and induce here, and then induce there. That's the same as starting here, and then inducing there, and then inducing there. 
Like induction induction is isomorphic to induction induction because they're both just induction all the way from here to there. Okay? So that is an isomorphism. And this guy transforms into some cool looking diagram that looks something like um, that looks something like this. Um, and all these regions are colored. Okay, but this sort of becomes splayed out. And so, you know, this utility of having maps of non-zero non degree allows us to take this sort of thing which generates it and can't be decomposed further and decompose it into a bunch of more elementary building blocks, three crossings and a, and a cup. And each of these are not zero degree. The degrees just add up to zero. Okay. So, so having non-zero degree maps actually makes things easier. And this is easier than that. I think it's, it's more local. It's more zoomed in. Although many people would probably think it's harder. <laughs> okay. And so using this, you know, we have a functor, and you can directly show equivalence. Just using sort of purely diagrammatic arguments. This is as easy as it gets. Okay? And the other thing is that since we don't care about the sum ends, we're not even trying to show that the sum ends are equivalent. We don't need the decomposition theorem at all. We don't care what the sum ends look like. So that's, that's another, another key point. But let's ignore that for now. And this also quantizes. So this guy. They, in fact, what they described was the description for UQ, SLN. And this thing is you just do it for that Cartan matrix that I drew at the beginning of lecture. This weird Q deformed matrix, which still gives an action of the affine law group. And magically, this equivalent still holds. <laughs> So I kind of discovered this by figuring out what would correspond to the Q version. And I still have no idea why. I mean, this is the unique one parameter complex deformation of the of a reflection representation. And it's the thing which, when you set Q to be a 2M period of unity, factors through killing the M multiples of roots. So it's, it's an interesting representation. Um, but I, 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 it doesn't really appear anywhere in the literature. OK, so maybe diagrammatics are a new tool. Hopefully, I've convinced you that this is just algebraic manipulation. and There weren't too many tears involved. Maybe you personally had tears. I don't know. Or yawns. Yawns are more likely, but I'm less worried. So it's time for tears. So, by which I mean I'm going to try to explain to you how you get from geometric satake to this thing. So, if you don't know anything about geometric satake or don't care, then I don't care if you, I don't care if you weave and or cry. Okay? But uh, I'm going to get from geometric satake to circle satake. And this is really going to be at, at q equals 1, because again, there's no geometry for the general case. Okay? So, what's going on? So what does geometric satake says? What does it say? So we choose a Lie group G, an algebraic group G, and we have its Langlands dual. Okay, so let's just give some examples. For instance, G could be GLN. And its Langlands dual is GLN. Or G could be SLN. And its Langlands dual in that case is PGLN which is also known as SLN, modulo its center. So its center is generated by roots of unity scalar matrices. OK? Um, and we let K be the power series, the Laurent power series. And we let O be just plain old power series. And so you can talk about, say, you know, G hat of K, or G hat, G check of O, um, which for, for GLN, for instance, would be 
matrices with values which are power series. So the statement of geometric Satake is that perverse sheaves, which are right and left equivariant under GO on GK, <laughs> This is a monoidal category. So whenever the right and left equivariance is the same, you can do this convolution multiplication. And this is equivalent to another monoidal category, namely representations of G. And this equivalence actually factors uh, if over, so it fibers over a vect in the sense that you can take a representation and forget the fact that it's a representation, and we'll go to get a vector space. Whereas over here, you can take a perverse sheaf, view it as a sheaf, take its uh, global sections, get its hypercohomology, and you get a vector space. And, and um, the cohomological grading is the weight grading. So this is a very nice equivalence. Everything about the representation theory is really encoded in this guy. So this is what geometric Satake says. Now my word of caution is that in the literature, you usually see it differently. So in the, in the, you know, I said, let's work with perverse sheaves, which are GO, GO, equivariant on GK. But really, this is the same thing, since the action of GO on GK is free, and there's some nice properties as, or it's roughly the same thing as just taking left invariance on the quotient space. I mean, so this would really be true on the nose if this thing were unipotent. And I'm not sure actually this is true on the nose, but they're close enough. Um, and people usually write it this way. So this thing right here is called the affine Grassmannian. Okay? Uh, it's you know, if you think about what this is a stabilizer, if it's a stabilizer of a lattice and an n-dimensional uh, vector space over k. Um, so you're looking at all lattices inside, inside this n-dimensional vector space. That's what the affine Grassmannian is. But, you know, to say this is a monoidal structure is really a lie. Okay? This is like mixing up the regular representation with, with the algebra that acts on it. Okay? This is my pet peeve. So don't do it. <laughs> you should really be thinking of this. And this will be important in a sec. Okay. So I'm going to transform this to Zergel Satake in three easy steps, all of which are tautological. Um, and have already appeared in the literature sort of aren't really put together anywhere. Well, uh, or you know, maybe people just didn't care about them. So here's step one, is to replace with two categories. OK. So what's the point? Pi 0 of this so-called loop space is the same thing as pi 1 of g. Okay, which is not necessarily trivial. So that this space can be disconnected. Okay? If it has a bunch of connected components, sheaves on one component aren't doing anything to sheaves on the other component. So just like even in odd representations, this thing splits. Okay? So um, you know, in the particular case where G is of adjoint type, so that pi 1 is the biggest, this thing is actually just omega. Omega for G, not for G check. Okay, this is some weird Langlands dual thing. Okay, omega for G. Okay, um, and in general, it's some subgroup. Okay, so this is disconnected, which means that you know, and which means that this thing is disconnected. So the thing that acts on it should really be splitting up into two categories. Okay. But, you know, so there's a better way to unravel this, okay? You know, if you're taking, say, perverse sheaves equivariant under some subgroup on, well, I'll take the null component 
and then act by some element to get to some other component. Okay? Well, you might as well undo the action of that element. And when you transfer this back to some kind of perverse sheaf on, so when you pull it back along the action of chi, and you get a perverse sheaf on the null component, but this is no longer equivariant under H, it's equivariant under a conjugate of H. Fair enough. Okay? So we should be looking at um, conjugates of, of GO acting on GK. Okay? So we instead work with this two category, where the objects are elements of this group, and where hum from eta to chi are supposed to be perverse sheaves, which are g check eta, g check chi equivariant on the null components of g check k. So I've transferred everything to the null component. I'll explain why you do this in a sec. So where does this g check chi? Well, I'm going to write chi of g check o. So it's conjugation when this is actually a component. But actually, this is just a subgroup of that, in which case it's not really conjugation, it's actually an outer automorphism. But there's still some automorphism. There's actually a whole set of automorphisms corresponding to this whole group that act to permute things isomorphic to, to things. And so they're not all conjugates. Some of them are just outer conjugates. So you can do this for the whole omega, even though pi zero is actually smaller. Okay. So, in other words, it didn't actually matter which group you chose. The whole group omega is embedded in there somewhere. Okay? And, in fact, the null component doesn't really depend on which group you chose either. I mean, it does, but if you take g check k and you mod out by g check o, it didn't ma and you only look at the null component, then it didn't matter which g check you chose. Okay? So this is actually independent of the choice of G check, which is particularly nice, I think. Okay, so to give you an example, what GB, say GLN or SLN or PGLN, I really don't care. Let chi be a number of copies of T, then a bunch of copies of 1. So this is not an SLN. It is in PGLN or GLN. But even though it's not an SLN, if you conjugate by it, it preserves SLN. Okay? Or, you know, SLNO. Okay? And so if GO is n by n matrices where everything is an O, then uh, G chi, you know, there's three of these things. You take a three and an n minus three block. You put O's here and O's there and T O's here and T inverse O's there. And this is another subgroup isomorphic to GO. And, you know, what's another thing that's interesting is that um, the intersection of all these G chi's is, uh, is exactly the Iwahori. Or maybe if I put a T inverse here and a T there, then it's exactly the Iwahori. Okay? So this is, uh, um, this has to do with the fact that the intersection of all the ways to remove one vertex is empty. This is only true in type A. It ends up being essential. Okay, that was step one. Step two, replace the loop group, see why there's tiers here, with the Katz-Moody group. This is some crazy thing. Okay? So there's some G associated to an affine Dinkin diagram, and uh, inside it there's a parabolic attached to any, any subgroup of the, of the affine Dinkin diagram. So then inside that there's the sort of Iwahori, which is attached to the empty set. Okay? And so basically these G chi's. I mean, perhaps I haven't said this yet, um, but omega is in bijection with um, the removable vertices in the affine Dinkin diagram. 
Okay? These are the vertices that you can get rid of, and, and what remains is the finite Dinkin diagram. This is another nice feature of, uh, and again, this is for G, not for G check, for some weird reason, or A for Wang Wen's duality. Okay? So really, you think of G chi as actually corresponding to, the, to this maximal parabolic. Okay? Um, and in fact, so there's no difference. If you take G and you mod out by a maximal parabolic, then the G of the Katsmudi, that's the same thing as GK mod GO. Okay? So, um, sorry, G. Okay? These are actually the same space. However, you can upgrade the equivariance. Okay? So instead of taking G chi equivariance, you can take PI equivariance. And the difference is that this guy's bigger. It has a bigger torus. Okay? So the utility is that so we're going to work with perverse sheaves, which are PI, PJ equivariance on this Katz Moody algebra. But the advantage is that the advantage is that more there's more equivariance. So we've sort of added to the size of our torus, which is important for the reason you'll see in a sec. Take equivariant global sections. So we saw that really the functor, the geometric Satake equivalence, was take global sections. But now we do it equivariantly. Okay? And if we take equivariant global sections, we get bimodules over the PI equivariant cohomology of a point. And these things are naturally subrings of the Iwahori equivariant cohomology of a point. Actually, maybe I'll write P empty set because we're working in this context, in the Katz Moody context. Okay? So the thing you should realize is that the cohomology of P empty set is this R, this ring R associated to this thing of the affine wall group. Whereas if we'd only done the Iwahori equivariant thing, the Iwahori projects down to the Borel. So we, we, we would only get the finite version. This isn't big enough to contain lots of different copies. There's, no, there's, you know, there's an affine log group action on this, but not multiple different finite copies, whereas we want like, really multiple different copies of the finite log group inside this. So that's why we need to go to this case. And then, of course, PI, uh, equivariant cohomology of a point, is RI. Are f w finite, but uh, different copies of w finite. And so the image, so this sort of theorem of Zergel and Herterich, is that equivariant global sections um, has image uh, given by these singular Zergel bimodules. I guess in this case, maximally singular zero bimodules, and that it's fully faithful on semi symbols. So it's not fully faithful on everything, it's fully faithful on semi symbols. Actually, these categories all happen to be semi symbol already, but that's a miracle. It doesn't happen in general. Nonetheless, you can look at the additive subcategory of semi symbols and just work with that one, or push forwards from resolutions of singularities, even better. And so that tells us that, um, that tells us, that gives us Zirkel Satake. Um, and of course, step four was what I did in the first place. Find combinatorial subcategories to make life easy. Okay. Um, 
So this is the part that's not, not true, that you can only do in type A. OK, so that was a lot of tears, and of course. It was not intended to be a colloquium talk, so there are only a couple of suckers here. <laughs> um, OK, well, thank you. by Ragavan to pull no punches. Of this, so Zergul did this originally for um, the fi for not for Katsmoni, but just for normal finite flood varieties. Um, and Herterich upgraded it to all Katsmonis. Uh, so Zergul did this back in um, back in the early nineties. Um, Herterich was one of his students, and I think also did it in the nineties. But his it's his thesis, and it's only in German, so no one's ever read it. Should have paused and made you ask questions after the easy part. <laughs> Rather than stunning you. But this is all tautology. I knew what I had. I had Zergo Satake. I just needed to somehow get to Jimon Satake, which is silly. Oh, yeah.